denials are everywhere these days. And it's really good to distinguish the reason codes of what is a denial and what is a stall tactic. Because there are so many denials that aren't denials. To me, a real denial is when something is being not paid for a clinical reason. Like somebody thinks you're using experiment, a drug experimentally, or you have a combination of drugs that somebody thinks is experimental. That to me is a real denial. These are the top denied drugs in the Western United States. These are denied the most often. And one thing that they have in common, a lot of them, is they are for very small indications. Um, a lot of times people don't understand, you know, the indications. And, you know, also they're all branded drugs, as you can see. Some of them are old. I mean, Procrit, how many years has it been around? So there are, these are the top denied drugs in, in this part of the country. Now, what are, why are they denied? Well, they're not really all denied. What's the top denial code in this part of the country? 16. We need more information. What is that information? Sometimes, all of a sudden, a blues plan will turn around and want the NDC code. Or you didn't put the pre-cert number on the claim. Or they asked you to submit uh, the patient's previous therapies, and that was not submitted. So these payers, this is a stall tactic. So the most important thing that the financial counselor should do, or whoever's uh, getting the pre-cert, is make sure at the time of pre-cert, or at the time of prior authorization, that every single bit of information is given. It won't stop this, but it will reduce it. This, this constant, constant search for information uh, from the payers is a stall tactic, but it is really pertinent to try to nip it in the bud. Not medically necessary. Are all, not, are all 50s and 55, 55 being experimental use, are all 50s and 55s denials? Well, you're going to see a lot more 50s this time next year. A lot of times, 50s are the wrong diagnosis code, or in the case of Provenge, wrong combination of diagnosis codes, because you have to have two with Provenge. So if you're, if you're looking at some of these drugs, make sure you know the ICD-9 diagnosis code guidelines for that particular payer, and next year, make sure you know the ICD-10 guidelines, many of which are out, by the way. Non-covered service. Why wasn't it covered? Did the patient have valid insurance the day that they came to your clinic or practice? I see so many, many claims denied with coverage terminated. Every time that patient comes in, they need to have a contract with you where they tell you what has changed? And if not, if they don't tell you, they're liable. Because that, that is something I see all the time. What about the care is covered by another payer? You know, Medicare secondary payer is a big deal. A lot of these, these retirees still have that private insurance coverage. You need to know that. Pre-cert apps, pre-certification, pre-authorization is a must with all brand name drugs. And one thing that is happening is that the, the uh, insurance companies want this more and more. In other words, they used to give you a pre-cert or a pre-auth for six months. Now they're giving them for three. So at the end of three months, you get this message. So make sure at the beginning of therapy that you are asking those patient, that insurance company, when, how long is this for? Pre-authorization doesn't go on forever. You know, again, these are hurdles, but if you don't have, if you get 197, sometimes it's game over. And some of the manufacturers will not allow you to apply for patient assistance if you didn't get a pre-cert. Previously paid. 
you know, duplicate claims and, and constantly resubmitting claims is not a way to get them paid. It's call them up on the phone and find out where that money is. Because these, these are only drug denials. So 16, mostly clerical errors. Here are some of the reasons. Obviously, everybody should know their payer's policies. For, you know, there should be an electronic list of policies for your payers uh, or a physical book of policies for your payers, for your billers. Missing documentation, orders, summaries, report, chart, whatever they wanted. Missing lab tests. Obviously, if you're giving one of the HER2 family, you have to have a HER2 test. You know, if you're giving Herbitux, you have to have your test, your KRAS for that. Um, you know, you have to have lab tests for a lot of stuff. Or putting your uh, prior auth number on the claim. Medical necessity, we said, uh, is often a coding error. It's also important that if you're using off-label, if you're using a drug off-label or off-regimen, that you have the clinical data right there at your fingertips in case it is denied. It's important if you're from California or you're from another state that you know what those off-label laws are and that you take care of, uh, take care of your appeal by using those laws. You know, it's a basic lesson is to understand the match of treatment to the payer guidelines and your contracts up front. Um, denial code, non-covered charges. Uh, this, this code is used when RAC audits deny with RARC N432. Uh, Some of these denials stem for poor pre uh, patient screening, not adhering to the parameters of the, pa of the website, not having patient assume liability for treatments that may not be approved by the payer, or the treatment or service is not meeting your contract parameters. Sometimes somebody bills for it that is not on the panel of that particular payer. That's non-covered non charges. So the basic lesson is you have to have coverage, you have to know the coverage guideline for every big plan in your practice or clinic. Because if you didn't get the treatment prior authorized, you know, sometimes uh, that's the end of the story. Because, some, you know, you have to know which patient assistance programs will allow you to apply at that point. These are the types of services that may be appealed through Medicare. Other things like coding, if you have the wrong, if you like dropped a fifth digit off a claim or something like that, you can cancel the claim and rebill it. You know, if you have an invalid ICD-10 code this time next year, <laughs> you can cancel the claim and rebill it. Sometimes you can call up on the phone, or if you had some weird charge that didn't go through your clearinghouse, or, and it got knocked off the bill, and Medicare rejects the claim because it's not in the right format. All those kinds of things do not need to be appealed. But these are the kinds of things that can be appealed and should be appealed. Cert denials most certainly should be. Uh, writing a good appeal. Know your state cancer laws. Off-label and clinical trials. In, in our state medical association has a managed care division that will help you write appeals if you need that. They will actually do that. Um, they have a whole managed care division with lawyers. Uh, there also is a place if your patient wants to fight with Medicare, and you don't really want to fight with them for whatever reason, there's a place called the Medicare Rights, uh, Medicare Rights Center, and it, you can contact them online, and they have lawyers that will e either actually help you or your patient appeal something with Medicare. These are all the steps. One thing you need to know about administrative law judges they are so backed up. There are not enough ALJs. Why is that? Because there are too many people auditing Medicare claims. There are the RACs, the CERTs, the fraud police, sometimes known as the ZIPX. There are just too many appeals. You know, cancer claims are large, so people look at them. But these are the various levels. And whenever I've gone to an ALJ, I've won. And the reason that you win when you go to an ALJ is because you know you have a good case. And, and you don't go to that level unless you know it. How do you know if you have a good case? Knowing your Medicare laws. 
and knowing that they did something wrong. And it doesn't help to, ha it doesn't hurt if a lot of money is involved to have a lawyer with you. Um, obviously, if you have a clinically based argument, you must have uh, lots and lots of evidence. And one piece of evidence that people don't think about, but it is part of the Medicare law, is community standard. This is the community standard. This is what we do. And even just having physicians in your community testify to that is actually evidence. But you, you should have your compendia, your articles. You know, Medicare does accept certain articles. Now, one of the things when I ran hotlines and we did a lot of appeals for providers in all specialties, we used a thing called appeal solutions. And they have both appeal letters and they have all the cancer uh, the state cancer laws in letter format to go right to whoever you're addressing about off-label use. So they have all that formatted for you. They have every kind of appeal you could possibly want. If you're a very large facility and you do a lot of appeals, then you can get their software. But I think they're really a great resource. These days, um, the last thing that you want to do as a financial counselor or somebody that supervises financial counselors is delay the patient's treatment. So how do you know when you have a patient and you are talking to them about their initial treatment, will they qualify for assistance? Will they qualify for patient assistance? Let's say you can't get a pre-cert for that patient, so they're going to be rendered uninsured. Or let's say their care has been denied because it's off-label, and the drug company will, not all of them will, but some of them will uh, allow that patient to go on PAP. How do you know if that patient is really, really qualified? Well, first of all, have they been rendered uninsured? Do they, is their insurance denying their care or do they just not have any insurance? Everybody on Obamacare, be it covered California or if you're from a different state, make sure that you verify every month, at least once a month, that that patient is still on that insurance. Are they a veteran? Do they qualify for Medicaid? We talked about that. Can they receive an exchange plan with a subsidy? Are there charitable organizations like their church that will take them? Have they been disabled with cancer for two years and could they apply for disability and therefore get Medicare? All of these different avenues. Now, do they qualify clinically? Does that drug company accept off-label use for PAP? Some do, some don't. And they must have an order for, or a prescription for a drug. Do they qualify financially? But nowadays, many of, many of the drug companies publish their guidelines. They want you to know about them. They want you to use their programs. And many of them are between five and 600% of the federal poverty guidelines. Not all of them are, but a great many of them are. And so this is what five to 600% looks like. Sometimes, and it, it really benefits us in California, so it's, it's really important to know that you don't necessarily have to be poor anymore to apply for these programs. Now, the copay programs uh, are a little bit different. Now, some of the, um, some of the and also they want proof of income, so they want uh, tax statements or bank statements, but a lot of the programs will allow people to start on drug without this proof of, we called it, you know, in our business we call it POI, proof of income. A lot of these programs don't make you have proof of income before they'll let the patient start on drug. Some PAPs, besides having an income requirement, have a list liquid asset requirement. And one of the most odious of these, I used to hate to tell people this, that if you have a lot of money in your 401k, IRA, SEP, any of those things, those count as liquid assets and they count against you. A lot of programs have removed that because patients do not want to go in their retirement fund to pay for drugs. And anybody that suggests that, they, they aren't real happy about. Um, but it's not the patient's house or car. It is stocks and marketable securities, uh, other real estate, other investment transactions. 
So those are other requirements. Copay cards have similar requirements. They may also include these prerequisites, no Medigap, Medicaid, Part D, or veterans. Uh, they must have spent down to a certain level on the copay, like some of them are 150 bucks, some of them are 50 bucks, some of them are 25, they go all over the way. And copay support may have a ceiling per year as well. So that's a good thing to check. You must choose whether the copay card goes to the provider or to the patient. Some of them go directly to the patient, some of them can go to the provider to apply to you know, the private insurance. So make sure you know, because the patient, you don't want it to go to the patient if you're providing the patient with drug and they're running down the street with their copay. Now this is, the big problem with PAP programs is they take a long time. Because if it's a drug you don't use very often, I mean obviously if it's something you use every day, you know where their PAP program is, but if it's something that you use, you know, you have five patients a year, you certainly don't know. So people are, lo first of all, verifying insurance, then they have to locate and evaluate assistance programs. They either call or read the application to ascertain requirements. Then the patient has to do their portion and sign it, which actually takes the longest time. The patient completes the office portion. That doesn't take so long anymore, because a lot of these, it, this has been reduced, because a lot of the programs have portals now. And then the entire application is submitted. So the whole thing takes about eight days. The longest thing is patients completing their portion, getting their proof of income or whatever they have to get. So it's really good before the patient comes for their first financial interview to make sure that you know that if they will need assistance for these very expensive drugs, that you think they're going to need any kind of assistance that they bring that stuff with them. And that way you can get them qualified, get them on the drug, and get them out the door. Um, one other thing that, that I did want to bring up is that uh, many of these programs are now uh, elect more electronic, so make sure that you're enrolled in these portals. This is such a quick talk for me. Thank you.